Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Uh, today, I'm delighted to talk to Azar Hussein. You're most welcome, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah, Paul. Thank you for hosting me. It's great to have you on, sir. Um, Azar began his religious studies in 2003 in the Qasid Arabic Language School in Jordan. Thereafter, he continued his studies privately, uh, reading intermediate and advanced uh, level texts in major Islamic sciences with a number of notable scholars. And today we're going to be uh, discussing uh, this extraordinary book, The Sublime Gift. It's so beautifully produced, and we'll come back to this in uh, a second. And uh, it's known uh, in Arabic as Al Hadiya Al Alaiya, forgive me if that's mispronounced. Um, it's one of the finest legal texts in the Hanafi school of Islamic jurisprudence, the one that's followed perhaps by most Muslims in the world. It details the rulings of Islamic worship, the Muslim creed, lawful and prohibited matters in everyday life, and beneficial points of decorum. I'm going to, going to give some examples later. It's absolutely fascinating. As well as the core teachings that every Muslim should be familiar with, uh, Allah al-Din Abidin, this is the author who died in 1889, um, adds details and legal subtleties rarely found in books in this genre. And I just want to read um, a recommendation on the back cover of the sublime uh, gift from uh, Zaytuna College, actually, in California. Abu Zara Press, this is the publishers, is to be commended for the publication of this masterful work of Hanafi law by the erudite scholar Ala Adin Abedin, in his excellent translation and annotations, Azar, our guest today, uh, has provided English readers with a critical resource for the Hanafi school that will be of great benefit to students and teachers alike, God willing. And then the commentator here makes something I think really frames this very well. And he, he writes, the ultimate fruit of such works is to ensure that our worship is aligned with the pleasure of Allah Most High, and such fruit is beyond measure. Uh, beautiful, beautifully put, and I think. So that's why this is not like a, a bit of textual archaeology. This is not just an academic text. It is actually uh, helping us to worship God. And that's the ultimate purpose of our lives, of course, is to worship God. And that's uh, by a faculty member, uh, Faraz Al Khan at Zaytuna College. He wrote that. Um, so it's enough from me. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Thank you again, uh, Paul, for your generosity in ho hosting me. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you. I'll probably speak for 20, 30 minutes. I'd just like to give uh, a brief introduction to the book, and I've uh, prepared four or five slides. And what I'll be talking about is four matters, really. I'll start off by talking about the authors. So Muhammad Amin ibn Abidin and Alauddin Abidin. And I'll discuss a little bit later why I have written two names there and not one. Then I'll go into the text itself, al hadiya al al Alaiya, literally the gift of Alauddin. Uh, and I'll discuss why we chose this book, why we thought this book is important, that it's available in the English language. So then thirdly, I'll talk about the features of the translation. So as a translator, what work have I done to enhance the text and make it relevant to readers today? And then finally, what we've done is I'll just go into one case study, look at one legal ruling, which is actually at the back of the book, and explain how some of the features of the book and the translation that I've discussed above are brought out in that particular example. Mm. Please do, I mean, I'm assuming when I'm talking that people are not, you know, students of Hanafi, Hanafi Fik necessarily, they might not even be Hanafis. So if I'm mentioning things which are non-familiar terms to uh, people, then please just stop me and ask, um, and inshallah, I'll try my best to clarify. Inshallah. Moving on to the writers, who are they? Firstly, we've got Muhammad Amin Ibn Abidin died 1836, normally simply referred to as Ibn Abidin. He's the father, and the author of the sublime gift, al Hadiya al Alaiya, was his son, Alauddin Abidin. He's the actual author, and we'll talk about him in a second. So Ibn Abidin, the father, he was the Hanufi imam of his time. His greatest work was uh, the Radul Muhtar, that was his magnum opus. 
very, very quickly became the most authoritative work of lay Hanafi fake. And it became the most off-sited work of Hanafi uh, fake. So even when you go to the books of Fatawa, which is basically a collection of the Q&As that ulama wrote of India and Pakistan, if you go to anyone after his time, regardless of who they are, you will see on every single page on their books of Fatawa, you'll see the Rad al-Muhtar has been cited. And okay, today, if you want... Can I just pause? Sorry, you, you, you invited uh, uh, me earlier to, to ask a question. Uh, Hanafi. Hanafi, this refers to, uh, uh, just for those who might not know, could you just explain very briefly who uh, this eponymous founder, who the eponymous founder of uh, the Hanafi school was, just very briefly? Yeah, of course. So in, in Sunni Islam, there's four schools of Islamic jurisprudence or fiqh. Mm -hmm. You got uh, Hanafi, the first, uh, Abu Hanifa, who was the founder of the first school, the Hanafi school. Then you've got uh, the Shafi'i school. You've got the Maliki school of the, and the Hanbali school. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Imam Abu Hanifa. He was the first founder of the school. Right. And uh, so that's why we're talking here about and the and Hanafi. He, and he knew some of the people who, who had met the Prophet himself. I mean, he was really seriously early, wasn't he? And he's the, I see yeah. the founder of the first uh, school of Islamic law and, and probably the most widely followed in the world today. Th that's correct. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he took the fiqh of the people of Iraq. And, you know, by that time in uh, Iraq, many of the companions, especially Ibn Mas'ud, one of the most learned of the companions, uh, uh, was there. And then his students were there. Mm -hmm. And really what Abu Hanifa was doing was codifying and adopting the, the school of Iraq. Right. Okay. Fantastic. And 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 this book is, uh, as 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 you say, is a a book in that tradition, representing that school of thought. Uh, but the most kind of what, what the most one of the most distinguished recent manifestations of that jurisprudence. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for that. That that's correct, Paul. And if you went today with a question to a Hanafi scholar, and if he was looking for an answer, the probably the first book that he'll pick up to look for the answer will be the Rad al Muhtar. Mm -hmm. So even Abdin's work really is that crucial. I think it's actually just behind my left ear there somewhere on my shelf as, a, uh, as well. And it's actually just been republished uh, in Egypt, I think. And there was a team of Syrian academics who worked over it for a decade, just wow. going back to the manuscripts and uh, referencing the work back to all the primary resources. And because he was such a brilliant scholar and he had right. so much resources, it actually took him a best part of a decade, interrupted by the war in Syria as well. But Alhamdulillah, it's just recently published in 20 odd volumes. Okay. Um, and then who's the son, Alauddin Abidin? He actually went on, in, and if you look at his, some of his key achievements, the three things that he did, which I picked out here is, one, he went on and finished his father's book. The Rad al wasn't complete. So out of the original two volumes of his were done by the father, uh, sorry, the son, Alauddin, just to finish his father's work. Mm. He also traveled, and I think it's important, this, this traveling that he did to uh, Istanbul, Turkey, and he was part of a seven-man committee which drafted the Al-Majalla, which was basically the Ottoman attempt to codify Hanafi fiqh. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, what this was and why it's important over the page, inshallah. And then the third thing that he did was he authored al hadi al al which was actually... Which is our text, yeah, the sublime gift, yeah. Okay. What's interesting, Paul, it was actually written for school children. Yeah, I, I found that a bit baffling, to be honest. Maybe um, my level is a bit childish, but I found mm -hmm. it uh, very much an adult read. But anyway. Yeah, yeah I, I've had a few people say it to me, oh, look, it's a uh, reference work, is quite challenging to read. I've not kind of had the heart to break the news to them. <laughs> that was actually written and, for and, and actually, I mean, I wasn't going to mention this, but uh, when it comes to examples uh, that I've cherry-picked, really, from the book, uh, some are quite explicit, uh, I mean, sexually explicit. I mean, it, it's not in an inappropriate way, but just very factually explicit when the law requires to address certain matters. So I'm thinking, okay, children were exposed to that. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's interesting, Paul, that is what I think everyone, when you read your first uh, book of fake, you go through this experience and think, oh my word, this is really explicit. But I think they had to be, right? They're explaining right. matters of law, what makes your prayer valid, what makes your voodoo invalid. Yeah, so they couldn't true. afford to leave things between the line. They had mm -hmm. to be explicit so that the legal ruling was clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. And, um, and then I think 
the th when I just look at the biographies of both of them, a couple of things uh, struck me. One on Aladdin was the breadth of his writing. At mm -hmm. one point, he's writing advanced legal texts for muftis and judges uh, in Istanbul. And then at the second time, he's writing for school children in Damascus. So mm -hmm. obviously that shows one, his adaptability as a scholar. And then if you, I think it's important to bear in mind the time that they were writing in. Uh, this is the beginning of the end of Ottoman rule in Syria, which ended in 1990, 1919, sorry. So you kind of get the beginning of the onslaught of Western uh, values upon Muslim lands. Yeah. Uh, you, you can see what in his life is part of the struggle of the resistance of this uh, Western onslaught. So he's doing it at the state level where he's trying to you know, push back the dominance of Western law. And then he's also he kind of clearly understands that in terms of preserving Muslim civilization, building the next generation, actually educating children was an integral part of that process. Mm -hmm. That's why when he returns to Damascus at the end of his life, he writes this book for children, which mm -hmm. uh, you know he hopes will be kind of part of this uh, renewal process. Mm -hmm. And you know you can see from what is uh, what he's doing that he was a scholar of his times and mm -hmm. and he was a scholar of the people. And yet he says at the back of the, the sublime gift, when he's making his concluding remarks, he says, look, whoever, whichever scholar is not knowledgeable about the needs and concerns of the people of his time, he's indeed not a scholar. So right. actually, you know, being a part of the people and understanding that concerns, needs at that particular moment of time, he saw as vitally important to um, uh, being uh, a scholar of Islam. And the second point, which you've uh, interestingly already touched upon, both father and son were initiated into Sufi orders, uh, Qadri and Khalwati, respectively. And I think that was an influence that that that, uh, that was an important influence on their fiqh. So, like you explained quite beautifully already, they, it wasn't law for law's sake, but the law was a means to achieve, uh, you know, uh, um, spiritual excellence and uh, improving one's re relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Mm -hmm. and worshipping him as he wishes to be worshipped. And that, I think, combination uh, of legal and spiritual is really powerful. Certainly in the Arabic, it's very, very powerful when you read it. And I hope, inshallah, something of that we've been able to bring out uh, to the English readers in the English translation, inshallah. And, and I think that that, that that point you made, that latter point you made, is, is so interesting because Western law today uh, in Britain, the United States, the European Union and so on, is avowedly secular. Um, and there's no sense that uh, law is a part of a wider um, uh, lived experience where there is worship uh, and there's spirituality and so on. It's It really is a, a very um, worldly centered, non-theocentric understanding of law. And, and that's part of the beauty, I think, uh, of Islam itself is that it is it encompasses all of life. I don't mean that law encompasses in that legalistic sense, but that Islam itself in its spirituality and its deen it is very comprehensive in the way that Western legal codes are simply not. And that's something it didn't used to be like that in centuries past. Um, the, the West did have a spiritual understanding of law, but it's been lost and Islam retains that. And I think it's part of the Islam's gift to the world is to still speak in these holistic um, metaphysical terms about life in general. Um, anyway. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Paul. And I think some of the examples that you uh, that he brings out, especially in the back end of the book, where he talks about practical life, mm. are kind of really practical, and they're not legal just, but they're spiritual. So yeah. I don't know if you look at the bit where he gives an example that look, if you're a, um, a host and you're inviting people to your house for dinner, and he says, look, as a host, you know, don't go too extravagant on all the food and try to have twenty types. Uh, 20 types of different dishes to, you know, dazzle your uh, guests and show, um, show them, you know, how much money you've got and, uh, how, you know, how generous you are. He says, you know, guard your heart because if you do too much, then the extra, it becomes ostentation, it becomes showing off yeah. and you're losing your sincerity with God. And even you'll get a bit tired of the guests themselves because they become a burden on you. And then he explains to the uh, guests the look, you know, from your perspective, I think it was a peculiar, uh, peculiarity of the time that when people came, they probably wouldn't eat too much in public 
where they might eat a lot of him private. And that right. was to be someone who's, you know, who's a great Zahid and a Sufi. So he doesn't eat too much in public and he does, he's a bare minimalist, uh, as it were. And he says, look, justice is, if you want to protect your heart, eat, eat what you would eat at home. And that way you're not showing off. And I think that's just beautiful, right? Because he's, you know, he's very concerned for people's uh, sincerity. Mm -hmm. Over the page, we start talking about the text itself, uh, al hadi al al why did we choose it? The first thing for me is, if you actually look at it, it is a manual for life. Yes. It's not most single volume fake books, for people who are familiar with fake, will concentrate on ibadat which means purification, prayer, fasting, zakat, hajj. So, so you've got five elements of that book. He actually goes beyond that and he says at the end of the book, I've tried to write a volume which has all essential knowledge for your everyday life. And that's what he's trying to achieve. And one of the ways that he's done that is that he's added uh, two extra books, uh, book G, which is uh, the permissible and prohibited, and then also book H, which is a book on Akida, which again is a bit strange for a book of this size, but because he wants to give a kid everything that he needs in his life, he's mm. bought his other things in. And I think that adds, adds a, a lot of value to the book. Mm. I just want to show the contents page of uh, book G. It's about... Uh, oh, well, on, the, on the slides, sorry. Yeah, please, yeah. yeah. There you go. So this is the contents page of the permissible, uh, permissible and prohibited. It's the thick of everyday life. Those are four contents pages spread over four pages. So you might not see everything on the screen, but if you look at what's in there, mm -hmm. you know, he's got a section about eating and drinking and dress. Uh, there's a section about ornamentation and music. It's about mm -hmm. relaxation and merriment. What can you do? What's a lot of forms of relaxation? What's not? He talks about gender relations, uh, social interaction, how to behave in society, how to behave on the street, how to behave at home, you know, mm. when to give salams to people, not to give salams to people. He talks about knowledge and the different type, branches of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, he talks about who you can marry, who you can't marry. He's got a big section at the end of everything that's haram. Um, and he's got a section on, you know, things now the that if you did, would uh, take one outside the fold of Islam. So you can see a really broad scope uh, and a bit unusual for a book uh, of that size, but I think it also makes it an invaluable resource. Can I just pause on, on that and, and just share um, with, with people um, some words from that very uh, book G? Um, and you briefly mentioned salutations wherein it is disliked to greet with salams. So th these are occasions where uh, the writer says, uh, it's disliked to greet people saying salam, say, you know, peace, hello, really. And I just want to read this because uh, a, a bit of it. Because it is so, it's so interesting. Uh, this is page 499 of the book. It is disliked to greet with salams uh, someone who is a corrupt person and does not conceal his disobedience. If he conceals his disobedience, then it is not disliked. Similarly, it is disliked to greet someone who is either physically unable to reply, for example, someone who is eating, or someone who is unable to reply due to the restrictions of sacred law. And then he gives examples, uh, for example, performing the ritual prayers. You're not supposed to, get to greet someone who's obviously praying Salah, reciting the Quran or remembering Allah, delivering the Friday sermon, uh, listening to any of the aforementioned. Students of Islamic jurisprudence repeating a lesson to themselves. Um, a teacher, whilst teaching, you're not supposed to interrupt them. And then, uh, this is interesting, young ladies who are of marriageable kin. So, you know, you're not supposed to greet young, young women who you could marry, say salam to them. And then someone who plays impermissible games, slanders people, or flies birds. Now, this is where it gets a little bit odd because in English, you know, flying birds, what's that got to do with it? But um, uh, And then old wags, habitual liar, and someone of idle talk or who insults people. What's an old wag? What, what, why shouldn't we say salams to an old wag, do you think? It's all, I think what he's trying to get at is that old wags is just like old women who told a lot of tales and, you know, made stories up to amuse people. So it was a kind of people who were just kind of time-wasting. 
Right. And uh, so there's another section here where he talks about time wasting and what you can do and what you can't do. And so while it's permissible to, you know, I, I think uh, there's a great quote from Sayyidina Ali where he says, look, you know, the, the human mind is like the body that, you know, it gets tired. <laughs> So th th there's, there's no problem having a time, you know, for this and a time for that, uh, or a time for relaxation or a time for seriousness. But if it becomes excessive or involves, you know, tales and mixing uh, with the wrong sorts of people or people who just call time wasters generally, I think that's what he's getting at. And those people, what he's basically saying, those are people who are what we would call openly fasic or openly morally corrupt. So by giving salam to them, you kind of give an importance yeah. uh, and respect to them that would not be yeah. that should only be due to uh, you know a, a person who's not outwardly corrupt. And that, that's such a again a, a bringing a very moral dimension to our interactions with people. Uh, and just another final paragraph from this uh, particular section on situations wherein it is disliked to greet with salams. He says, "The one who comes from behind greets the other person with salams." And the one who is walking greets the one who is sitting. Similarly, the one riding an animal greets the one walking. Uh, the one lesser in age greets the older person. If two people meet, the best is the one who proceeds in giving salams. If they give salams simultaneously, each one returns the other's salams. The smaller group initiates the greeting to the larger groups, all these subtle etiquettes of how one gives uh, salams. Very, absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm going to indulge myself here. Just, I'll just share another a few sections. Name giving in accordance with sacred law is actually the next page, page 501. Name giving in accordance with the sacred law. And uh, as almost at random, I'm always cherry picking just examples. A boy is named with a boy's name and a girl with a girl's name. Now you might think, what a weird thing to say, but actually, <laughs> without no, going without <laughs> subject too much, actually it's no longer that weird thing to say. It really kind of pretty contemporary, even though it was written in the 19th century. Um, and and this was uh, and this this again is not not at all uh, woke. The next bit, it is disliked for a man to address his father or for a woman to address her husband by his name. Rather, one must employ a word that conveys respect such as liege lord, which is translating an Arabic word, and the like, due to their exceeding rights over the son and the wife. I'm not going to comment on that, but it's a, obviously a, a quite a different mentality from that prevalent in the West today. Yeah, and Paul, I'll, just, uh, sorry, uh, allow me. I think that's an interesting example of the con contextualization of fiqh. Because, you know, that example of a wife, you know, she shouldn't address um, her uh, husband by her name. Yeah. Now, if you ask, you know, current Hanufi scholars, they'll say, look, in that time, for a wife to call a, a husband by name was deemed on a disrespectful. So it'll probably offend the husband. He'll get all, all the com uh, community talking as well. Look how disrespectful she is and causes social problems. So that's why that recommendation was there. But where in our time, especially in a Western context, it wouldn't be deemed so. It wouldn't, there wouldn't be an issue, so there's perfectly permissible in, in a relationship for that to happen. And so, like one of the things that we try to do in the book is like those sort of subtleties where possible bring them out. But honestly, like just there's so many rulings in here as you've seen, it's not possible yes. to do it all the time. And that's why actually having a teacher to go through the book wow. is the ideal way you want to study the book. And, and this is for school children originally, and obviously they would have a teacher by by, by definition. So um, that's very helpful. And 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 just lastly about the name giving in accordance with sacred law is this paragraph that goes: talk that is in itself permissible is disliked in a mosque when one sits in the mosque for the purpose of talking. And this is so so contemporary in some ways. Similarly, it is disliked dislike to talk in the following cases. This is where you, you really perhaps shouldn't talk. And he lists some examples. With a raised voice whilst behind a funeral procession. Now that's very sensible, actually. Whilst relieving oneself. Whilst talking excessively during sexual intercourse. I'm not even going to go there. Whilst reciting the Quran. For some people to raise their voice during a sermon to utter la halaha illallah or to send greetings upon the prophet upon whom be peace. Um, so you're not supposed to raise your voice and uh, say these greetings during the sermon. 
and also just to talk during a preacher's sermon is also disliked. And I could go on and on with some fascinating examples of Islamic etiquette um, in, in this book, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Otherwise I go on forever. <laughs> thank you. for <laughs> Thank you for listening. I mean, this, this is one of the things about this book. You think you start reading it. Oh, that's interesting. And then you get kind of completely absorbed in this text because it just keeps on giving and giving. It's very, very rich in, in human detail and etiquette and all sorts of other subjects as well. It's one of the reasons I like it. And I think I don't know how you found it, Paul, but when I was kind of reading through it, I was always kind of comparing to our culture. So as a you know British Pakistani, effectively, you're kind of comparing, you know, how your parents' generation, your grandfather's generation, you know, the similarities and the differences between the cultures, which I found particularly interesting. Okay. Just back, we kind of, so we've talked about the, the features of the book, why we thought it was important. And then just the final point on that was like, because it's based on his father's Radul Muhtar, most of the book, if you go to it, actually the, the sublime gift, you can kind of see it word for word back, basically brought forward from his father's book. So he took his, you know, the seven volumes of his father and he put it into one volume essentially and added stuff on top. And therefore, by definition, it's a very, very uh, authoritative expression of the late Hanafi school in a single volume. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because we, we, we live in a time where you get so much information thrown at you, right? Even if you've kind of decided, yeah, I, I want to follow a school of law, and for me it's the Hanafi law, well, which Hanafi law? Um, I, and I know certainly growing up in the 90s, that was what, one of the issues that I had. I kind of struggled to understand, mm -hmm. you know, okay, I'm Hanafi, but exactly what does Hanafi mean? And, and I hope, inshallah, you know, subsequent generations of people coming through will have something that they can go to uh, as a primary reference point, uh, as a starting of their journey uh, as they go through the school, inshallah. And, and I think, so. I, I can't, I, I feel I must, I'd like to say this, if I, if I may. Although reading the, the, this chapter G, The Permissible Pivot, is an extremely rich experience. I do recommend people get this book just to experience that particular chapter. It, it, it does strike me that we, we need, still we need a contemporary restatement of Hanafi Fiqh. Uh, I'm thinking like, uh, I actually asked a Hanafi scholar, I won't mention his name, uh, quite a senior one, um, if it was permissible for a Muslim in the West who's been invited to a wedding to go to the wedding. The wedding was between two men. Okay. Now I won't give you his answer because it, it, I'm, I'm not, it's not the point. The point is that this is a question that's probably unprecedented in the history of, of, of Islam. Well, maybe not, but it wouldn't be surprised if it was. Now this is obviously not addressed in this tone uh, for obvious reasons, because such a thing would have been totally unthinkable and it's pretty unthinkable today for most people. But anyway, um, so th these are real questions though. Uh, uh, you know, if you have Muslim, if you have colleagues at work, you know, if you live in London or New York or Paris or Berlin, and you're Muslim and you're invited by your, your colleagues at work to go to their gay wedding, in inverted commas. Well, what's the flick on that? Is it no? Obviously no. Or is it whatever? You know, now I, I'm not giving a ruling here. I, I, I mean, I have my view. I, my own personal view is one doesn't go. But I'm saying it's a question people ask and have asked. So maybe there is still a room for a contemporary restatement of Hanafi Fiqh to address these particularly peculiar, peculiar issues that have risen in our time. Oh, you're 100% right, Paul. Uh, if you look at the chapters of Ibadat, which are worship, you know, mm. those are a little bit more stable and quite, I would say, 70-80% of them you can carry forward from historical books. But yeah. that particular chapter, which goes on to social issues, mm. uh, um, you know, it, it, it does need that. And, uh, you know, that we hope, you know, inshallah, subsequent generations of uh, British or, you know, uh, Western scholars who are kind of from this, uh, from the West, but also very, very deeply knowledgeable and uh, steeped in Islamic law, we kind of write those uh, types of textbooks uh, okay. inshallah, in, in the future. Inshallah. But I think the value of the historical books is, though, they'll, they will discuss issues like, for example, going to a wedding, uh, whether musical instruments are being played and there's other haram activities going on. So, you know, for example, that's uh, discussed in, in the Hidayah, I think it's documented <laughs> in the book as well. Right. And, you know, the conclusion they reached was, look, if you're a person of, who's a religious scholar and people view you as, you know, an authority of the religion, then you shouldn't go. Because right. if you go, then you're justifying it and you're saying, well, actually, you know, doing all of these haram things is fine. 
Yeah. But if you're a common person, you've got the other consideration that actually responding to someone's invitation is an obligation in itself. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got, you know, maintaining family ties is important, social ties is important. So you can go. Mm -hmm. So I think what those sorts of things do is, you know, it allows, um, you know, scholars can draw analogy from those circumstances mm -hmm. uh, to, to benefit uh, answering some of the questions uh, that you raise. Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay. It actually takes us nicely on to what's on the right-hand side here. Um, and I actually took this from uh, Sheikh Rizwan's foreword. I don't know if you had a chance to look at that, Paul, but uh, Sheikh Rizwan uh, contributed this foreword where he talked about the life of uh, Alauddin and he talked about his methodology to fiqh uh, in general. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of things that I wanted to bring out, a very knowledgeable uh, foreword, actually. He mentions a few things uh, and he says, look, this book was uh, 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 written alongside the Majalla, which was the codification of Hanafi law. So what was happening at that time was, you know, there were a lot of forces within um, Istanbul, within the, the uh, Ottoman times there, or people who were pushing that Western uh, systems of law should be adopted. Mm -hmm. So what uh, the ruler at the time did was he set up a seven-man committee and Al Alauddin was one of those people who sat on that committee and for the first time they codified Hanafi fiqh. Yeah. And by codified I mean like, you know, putting it into small articles uh, just as a Western statutory law is written out. And what this does was they were adopting the outward form of Western law but what they were actually doing was pushing back against Western law and saying you should adopt Hanafi fiqh because there were other forces they were saying, no, we should just take uh, French law as it yes. is, take the French civil code, adopt yes. it, and just get rid of Sharia law. So this was part uh, of his fight. So fiqh, you know, as he explains, is not something static. It, it's something that's alive. It's constantly going through uh, ongoing and constant renewal and change. Um, so... What I think the author Alauddin is, he's sitting somewhere between, you know, complete rejection of change and then also just completely throwing the baby out of the bathwater. Or rather, what he is is this pro process of uh, adoption and change. And I think that's important because, as I've explained, even though this text is only 140 years old, so any student of knowledge will tell you it's a, uh, a new book because most <laughs> of the <laughs> yeah, I love that. New book. It's only 140 years old. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because most of the stuff they're reading is five, six, seven hundred, a thousand years old. Wow. Yeah, you know, as you've already highlighted, even a relatively new book of this nature re requires work, explain, explanation, uh, clarification, elucidation. And this is, you know, w w one of the things that we've tried to do in the translation and the commentary. So what do we do? The first thing I actually did with the book, if you can see, uh, is we broke everything down into small numbered paragraphs, really mm -hmm. try to simplify almost one ruling at a time. We broke things down into lists, bullets, sub-bullets, and try to make the book as digestible as possible uh, for people. Uh, and I hope, inshallah, for subsequent generations of students, uh, you know, it'll make their lives easier uh, as they try to go through this journey. Uh, I think an important point, by the way, that you 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 have done that. You have, you have broken it down into digestible paragraphs uh, and with some clarificatory footnotes, which are uh, um, which are very helpful. And it, it is a very readable book, even though it is a legal text. Uh, um, contrary to what I think of legal text is actually um, interesting read, in my view. Uh, thank you, Paul. So. As well as the chapters that were in the original book, I've added an introduction to the school, which discusses some of the things that we've already talked about in terms of how the school was formed, the role of Abu Hanifa, you know, what are the common books of the school, the different levels of muftis, how they, you know, choose between different types of legal rulings, how those judgments are made. And then another important thing, we went through the different type, categories of legal rulings in the Hanafi school. Now, the four schools differ in terms of how they define their legal rulings. And the Hanafi school, to my knowledge, is one of the most complicated. So if something's, you know, an obligation upon you, it can be a fard or it can be a wajib, uh, which is, you know, something is an absolute obligation or something which is mandatory. If something is sunnah, 
it can be a sunnah akda a confirmed sunnah or it can be a lower grade it can be a non confirmed sunnah if something is dis- disliked it can be makru tahriman which is prohibitive dislike which is like closer to haram mm-hmm. or it can be somewhat disliked which is a bit closer to what's permitted so they use that terminology a lot in the book and you'll say look this is makru tahriman this is this this is that so it was important to explain to the reader right at the beginning exactly what these rule, uh, uh, grades are categories and what the consequences of doing them are and i think it's important for the other reason that a non understanding of these issues actually really, uh, causes a lot of the debates and differences within the community that we find in our times so i i just wanted to give an example here for example when you're making wudu in the hanafi school there's four things which are an absolute obligation what we say you know these are the arkan they're mandatory uh, they're uh, an obligation of fard so if you don't wash your face all of it if you don't wash your arms if you don't wash your feet if you don't wipe your uh, head there's no wudu your wudu's gone why is that so important because it's mentioned in a clear and clear categorical verse of the quran which yes. says look when you stand for prayer you got to wash your face you got to wash your arms right. so because the quran is mass transmitted to us because this is a definitive text that's definitive text which is not subject to in different interpretation we say look this establishes a clear obligation you have to do this yeah well if you go to the other end of the scale like in hanafi books of fiqh they will say look to wipe the back of the neck after you wiped your uh, head it, is recommended to wipe the back of the neck now some of the other schools don't do this no. and people will object to the hanafi school and say like no your evidence is non existent or if it exists it's weak the hadith is weak you're wrong whereas what the hanafi say is like look we know these hadiths exist we know that they have some weakness in them but in the book i explained this in one of the footnotes and i say look imam laknawi one of the indian hanfi scholars he says look we understand these hadith are weak but they have a collective strength therefore we think there's enough strength to make something recommended if you do it there's reward we're not saying it's a sunnah if you omit it there's no harm either so rather than just rejecting this hadith you give it an appropriate place right and i think that kind of nuance and understanding of how you deal with different texts and different kind of qualities and uh, strengths of evidence is is really really important and we mm-hmm. try to bring that nuance out again into the introduction so people have a bit more of a cultured understanding of what's going on in the school then we've also added a lot of commentary like on the original text there's actually 2400 footnotes yes. in there yes there are a lot of footnotes <laughs> Yeah, and many of them, the ones I've read are very elucidating. They're, they're not, um, you know, irrelevant. They're important to understanding the text. Yeah, yeah. Because what yeah. I've tried to do with the footnotes is either they're explaining and clarifying the text for you, mm-hmm. or they're providing further detailed rulings. Sometimes, you know, things that I think are quite practical and relevant still today, I've brought those out as further rulings. or are given evidences so for example you know what i just told you about wiping the back of the neck that's actually one of the footnotes in the book right uh, and honestly the purpose of giving those evidences was not so this is a manual of fighting for people and you can go and argue in the mosque with other people who follow different opinions mm-hmm. i just wanted people to be comfortable that what they're doing in the hanafi school has a basis yeah in, in the sunnah and in the in, in the quran so you can be content that what you're applying you're acting according to, to, to the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it's not something that uh, men later on uh, constructed from their own uh, selves so yeah. i thought that, that was an important thing and then most of the footnotes and the explanations are sourced from his father's book radul muhtar so I've almost kind of gone back and pulled out the most interesting things from that book and I did them here and there's actually 750 citations of his father's work uh, mm-hmm. in the sublime gift so i hope we bought you know some of the real fruits of his father's efforts forward for the english readers as well inshallah the next uh, thing that i've done here is i've added a book of supplementary notes that we've already uh, kind of looked at 
And again, what I've done in that is I bought out what I thought would be interesting to people. So firstly, there were things that were historically contested. And probably you've seen probably enough of uh, mosques in Britain here. They're often dominated by debates of, you know, when I'm praying, should I say the Amin aloud or should I say it quietly? Yeah. Where should I put my hands? Um, you know, like, should I, should I uh, what time should I pray the Asr? Because the Hanafis pray the Asr at a different time. So in these notes, I've just kind of given some of the evidences of the Hanafi school. They're not meant to be a decisive, um, you know, statement of, uh, of the ruling on that particular issue because, like, scholars have written books on each of these issues. So yes. if we went into detail, you know, this book would never end. And then I bought also contemporary issues out uh, in, in the book. So, you know, things like, you know, the use of musical instruments, uh, modern types of board games and different types of games, are they permissible, different type of, uh, you know, hairstyles, photography, television. I bought those issues out uh, right. here as well. And later on at the end, inshallah, we'll uh, pick out one of these issues so, so the reader... Um, you know, um, can uh, get a feel of what's going on. Uh, and to be honest, again, like, it's very difficult to give a, def a definitive statement. But what I wanted the reader to have is this, you can go to this as a place and say, give me a quick summary of what did the Han most authoritative Hanafi books say on this particular view viewpoint. So then when you're engaging either online or with other people in these discussions, at least you know what your starting point on your foundation is within the Hanafi school. Mm -hmm. Also in book J, what I've done is any supplication that's mentioned in the book. So if he says, look, at this point, you should recite this supplication in the prayer, recite this when you're uh, doing the Hajj, when you wake up in the morning, you know, when you go to sleep at night, when you do this, when you do that, this is the supplication. In that chapter, we've set out the Arabic text, English translation, a transliteration. And then we've also referenced that supplication back to the Hadith works, and we've graded it as well. Again, you know, people are quite keen these days to understand, you know, is that Hadith Sahih, is it Hassan or not? So they'd want to know, you know, is this genuinely from the Prophet Sallallahu So we've ascribed those so people can see that in a transparent manner exactly the strengths of those narrations. In Book J, there's 110 select biographies. So, you know, he might refer to, you know, Qasim Qutlu Bukha, for example, an, an Egyptian Hanafi scholar, and people don't know who he is, and they don't know, you know, the worth of that particular scholar and why what he says is important. Yeah. So we've given a three, four page line summary of who that scholar was, his main books, what time period he lived in, and really why what he says is uh, important. Again, mm -hmm. you know, creating more context for people. Mm -hmm. And then certainly for me an important feature at the end because this volume when I started the process it was never meant to be 900 pages mm. uh, and it because it became so long I thought it was very important to have an index and yeah. uh, you know Muhammad Ansar in Birmingham did an excellent job of a six to eight week period providing mm. a detailed 40 page index and I think that's really important inshallah people can now you know if you got a uh, you know, want to see something about nasal spray, you can go into the index and it'll give you the paragraph number where you can pick that issue up. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Am amazing work, I must say. Yeah. Thank you. So, so that's the work. Let's just take a quick example uh, of how this works. We've yeah. taken a case study of what breaks the fast. This is yeah. in the supplementary notes. And actually what I've done here is I've summarised uh, from a Pakistani scholar here, he wrote a short uh, treatise on this particular, this particular subject matter where he said, okay, what are the principles in the Hanafi school of what breaks the fast? And then how do you apply that to modern day circumstances to derive some rulings? So he says on the left hand side there, he says the principle is your fast is broken by anything which is customarily eaten for nutritional or medicinal purposes. So you're eating it either to gain you know, nutrition, energy, or as medication, and it reaches your body cavity. And by the co body cavity, it basically means the stomach or your throat or your intestines. 
and it has to go through one of the seven entry points which are listed on the left hand side there so it goes through the mouth it goes through the nose it goes through the ears any one of those points if it goes into the body through any an entry point which is not one of those seven like for example the eyes that doesn't break the fast it has to go through these seven yes yeah. And when we were talking about application of fig, I think it's important to note classical scholars, when they wrote, they said numbers five, six, and seven were valid entry points because they thought, for example, there was a connection between the ear and the stomach. So they thought if you put, applied medicine through the ear, it would reach the stomach and it would break the fast. Yeah. But whereas, you know, modern biology, I'm told, says no there's no connection between the ears unless you you know your eardrums broken it won't reach your stomach therefore if you apply medicine through the ears the modern day hanfi scholars will say that's fine it won't break uh, your fast whereas classical scholars did that and i think that's important again you know in terms of the development of fake and not having too much rigidity uh, to what was written uh, in, in the scholars by the past this is a very good example of that yeah. Can I just add uh, one interesting example that I came across? Uh, things that invalidate the fast and require a make-up fast. Uh, this is page uh, 294. And, and there is this thing. Uh, rain or snow, even if it is a drop, unintentionally enters the throat by itself or is swallowed accidentally. Now, this invalidates one's fast. Like, well, why on earth would that invalidate the fast? And then you put a footnote here rain or snow breaks the fast if it enters the throat by itself as it is possible to avoid by closing the mouth <laughs> in contrast dust and a small quantity such as a drop or two of perspiration or tears entering the mouth do not invalidate the fast as they cannot be avoided so uh, I just I love the, the the subtle detail there about the rain or snow going into the mouth does break your fast because you should be walking around <laughs> with your mouth open as the snow's coming down on you, which is kind of makes sense, I guess. Uh, but but things like sweat or tears don't invalidate because because they are uh, that they cannot be avoided. Uh, you say in the note, Su such subtlety uh, is is really amazing. Thank you for that. Mm, pleasure. Thank you. So just up applying these uh, rules uh, and principles, so we can say on the right hand side, what are the things that would break your fast? So for example, an asthma inhaler, that mm. would break your fast. Why? Because it's used for medicine purposes and it's got a valid entry point, which is the mouth. Therefore, obviously breaks your fast. The nasal spray, same thing, but this time your entry point is your nose. Again, the nasal spray would break your fast. Mm -hmm. uh, tablets and any t other type of kind of oral medicine that you're consuming similarly would also uh, break the fast. Over the page, things that wouldn't break your fast, and this is very commonly asked questions, is like injections or drips, because although they're going into your body, it, they're going through you know the surface of the body and not one of the seven entry points on the prior page. Similarly, with nicotine uh, patches, they're going through, you know, your body pores, not one of the seven entry points, not a problem. Eye drops are the same. You notice eyes weren't listed on the previous page as a valid entry points. Mm. Um, uh, oxygen, interestingly, oxygen masks are fine because it's just akin to the air that you're consuming on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, lip moisturizers or lipstick, again, uh, not a problem as long as you're not immediately kind of uh, licking it and uh, consuming any of that substance. Mm -hmm. uh, toothpaste, interestingly, people ask about a lot in itself. It doesn't break the fast because you're not consuming the uh, toothpaste, although scholars say it's somewhat disliked because there is, because when you're fasting, you shouldn't be tasting things deliberately. Uh, and also there's the risk that something might go uh, it, it, down into your stomach as well so it's best to uh, avoid it for that reason so just wanted to bring that out as a flavor of the sorts of uh, things that were discussed so that was everything i wanted to say um, from my side paul thank you for oh, listening no thank you very much uh for explaining in more detail uh the, the, the nature of, of this extraordinary uh text uh there we are the sublime give it's a beautifully produce volume actually um 
uh, it, it's, it, the paper quality is very good. The printing is very readable uh, and it's very digestible in terms of the, the layer of the text. I don't know if you can uh, see that there and some notes ooh, at the bottom. That's a dreadful bit of camera work there, but anyway. And um, I do really recommend it. I'll put a link uh, in the description below so you can get a copy uh, of it. But I understand you were saying earlier to, to me earlier on, actually, that um, there is a, a further global um, publishing um, print run. Is that right? So th there'd be a separate link for that? That's right. So at, at the moment, it's sold on the Abu Zahra Foundation website. I believe on the website of Makkah Books, there is already live. So if you go to Makkah Books, I'll drop you a, a link later. Okay. Uh, it, it is available on their website now for global distribution. Excellent. And um, all proceeds go to charity. Is that right? That, that's correct. So it's pu published by Abu Zahra Press. And uh, that's part of Abu Zahra Foundation here in uh, Keithley in uh, West Yorkshire, which is uh, basically it's, uh, an educational institute for children. Um, and, uh, you know, we've undergone a large refurbish pro refurbishment project over the last 10 years, converting a 19th century building. And alhamdulillah, we have like 150 children uh, coming to uh, the institute every day to learn uh, Islam. So this is all public book publications is one of our efforts to raise funds uh, for the foundation. Well, I do I do wish you well uh, uh, with, with, with that work. It's extraordinary uh, what you're doing there, I must say. Um, and I think that's probably it for now. Um, I say, uh, folks, do get your copy of this. I promise you it is a very absorbing read um, and uh, it's difficult to put down after a while, but one must occasionally put it down. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, there we go. Thank you so much, uh, Azal, for uh, your time and sharing your outstanding work. Congratulations on the publication of this book. I'm sure it will uh, be of interest to a great many people, inshallah, around the world, English-speaking people around the world. So thank you very much for your coming on today. Inshallah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for having me. And I've really enjoyed the conversation. Jazakumullah khairan. Alhamdulillah. Okay, take care.